wise men say only fools rush in but I can't help falling in love with you take my hand take my whole I can't help falling in love with you. Like the river flows, surely to the sea. Darling, so it goes, something's woman to be. Take my hand, take my whole life to let's every sing, cause I can't help falling in love with you. Let's sing again, cause I can't. I can't help falling in love with you. <laughs> All right. So what does Elvis have on us, you know? We have Elvis Lee. Um, so every week during our series on love, Changes Everything, we thought it'd be nice to start and just sort of uh, make us kind of get into a moment here, um, because our world cries out for love, and it's the desire of our heart to be loved and to love. And uh, we come to find what God says about love, to let it change our hearts, change how we love each other. And that's what we're doing uh, this month in the series in First John. So we're so glad you're here on this day. I, I don't know about, how many of you are native Southern Californians? Not Californians, Southern Californians, all right. All right, several of you like me. This is weird. It should not be this cold in May. It should not rain, but that's okay. Rain is the blessing of God. We're glad to have it. We are glad you're here today as we worship the Lord. Why don't you stand and join us as we worship the God of all love. We're going to sing about God's love. How love is furious for us. Nothing can tear us from. It's 
His love is fierce, his love is strong, and it's furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, and it's furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. his name on high. Bless the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord.
Sing like never before. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I will worship your holy name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, thank you for being here. I'd like to invite you all as we transition into our next part of the service to greet one another, maybe shake a couple hands, share a few blessings, and peace be with you. Well, good morning, everyone. You guys sound great this morning. Man, the singing was loud. Thank you, worship team. We appreciate you. It's great. Well, welcome. We're so glad you're here this morning with us. Um, just a few things to kind of update you on and things that are happening in the month of May. Um, but first, if you'd like to take out your I'm Here card and begin filling that out, we would love to know that you're with us this morning. Um, and there's a place on there on the back you can put prayer requests. We have a team that prays over those every week. And we are so thankful for them uh, to do that for us. And so um, feel free to drop that in the basket later on in the service. A um, few things coming up. We have our date night coming up next Saturday, May 13th from 5 to 8 o'clock. And this is an awesome time for both parents and kids. Parents get to go out and have a few hours to themselves, maybe hang out with some friends, um, or just go home and watch a movie. And the kids get to come here and have a fun luau and watch the movie Moana and have a great night um, together. Um, great opportunity for kids to connect with other kids, parents to connect with other parents, and um, invite a family to join you. And, and all the kids can come here and you guys can go out and have a great time. Um, $5 for each child and uh, you can sign up online at findcommunity.com slash date night. Um, we also have our Strengthening the Core small group that is starting up, and this is kind of a fun, interesting way of having a small group experience. Um, it's a seven-week um, small group, but the first meeting is in person here on May 21st at 11 o'clock, and then the rest of the sessions are on Facebook. So, um, you know, our social media world, we connect in person and we connect um, via social media. So I would encourage you to sign up for that, findcommunity.com slash uh, core. Um, you will learn about our six spiritual habits um, and what we value here as a church. Um, and so I would encourage you to do that, kind of a fun, interesting way to get connected. And last, we have our Mexico missions trip that's coming up in the summer, in June, uh, the 25th through the 30th. But there's, yeah, somebody back there is going. Um, yeah, all right. It's a great uh, place. It's Welcome Home um, Outreach down in Vicente Guerrero. I've been there myself. It's a great place. Um, you'll be doing some VBS for kids at their preschool and helping to build um, a home for, for a women's shelter. And if you're interested, but you're not quite sure, there's an information meeting um, on May 21st at 1230, and you will get all your questions answered. So I would encourage you to be praying about that. It's a family trip, so you can take your kids with you, um, and it would be a great, great experience for both you and your kids. Um, so as we continue in our service, uh, let's pray together. God, thanks so much for this morning. We just thank you for the beautiful weather that has broken through um, as we come to worship you, Lord, and we just thank you uh, for your love your love that changes everything, God, your love that changes us. And so this morning, as we hear your, your word, Lord, would you help it to just uh, penetrate our hearts and just help us to grow and change and love you more. In Jesus' name, amen.
See if I can. Hey, good morning, everybody. Just got to get something here I need. Okay. Thought we were going to be doing a pantomime service here for a second here. Well, a, um, um, some of you know today, or maybe you saw coming in, is Pancake Breakfast Day. So, and I, we had it Friday night after church, so what's better than having pancakes Friday night uh, after work for dinner? And um, there's bacon and sausage too. So just to support the youth ministry, uh, stay after, five bucks a head, all you can eat. Well, I think that's all you can eat. Just tell them I said that. You can have, you go back in line. And, uh, uh, and if you really don't want pancakes and sausage or whatever, um, just make a donation because this is all about helping our teenagers get to camp this summer. This is helping with the cost of camps. Camps are expensive enough for each family. We're trying to help with all the other costs. So that would be great. So, great. Well, hey, I wonder uh, this morning, how many of you have had a, don't raise your hands, how many of you had a conversation with Siri at some point? Or whatever your digital assistant's name is. Uh, Kathleen and I were in the car about a month ago, and we had a little bit longer time to drive, and we were talking about this series we're in right now on, on love and how love changes everything. So my somewhat techie wife, curious wife, the one I love dearly, takes out her phone and says, Siri, what is love? Now, I wanted you to know, Kathleen changed the voice on Siri from a female to a nice English proper male, <laughs> which got me wondering a little bit, anyway. But, um, <laughs> so, um, when she asked what is love, Siri said, male English Siri said, I'm not going there. <laughs> to which Kathleen asked, why not? Now it's starting to sound a little weird, I understand. And Siri says, I don't know. Kathleen asks the phone, do you love me? And Siri says, you're definitely starting to grow on me. <laughs> <clears throat> it was hilarious. Now, you've probably done this to Siri. You may have even asked weirder things. But um, I tried it with my phone. I was getting all kinds of different answers. So we, we discovered that Siri um, has a mind of her own. So let's try it this morning to see what happens, okay? So, Siri, what is love? Uh, Siri, do you love me? Siri, do you love me? I respect you. <laughs> All right, let me, let me show you on the screen. I tried this this week, and every time you get somewhat different answers. When I asked her earlier in the week, what is love, her answer was, I can't answer that, which I thought was fun or interesting. Uh, so I asked it again, um, what is love? And then I got a definition. As I understand it, love refers to a deep, tender, ineffable uh, feeling of affection and solicitude. Yeah, right, whatever that is. <laughs> so then I said, Siri, do you love me? And that last, a few days ago, she said, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> I'm starting to get a little self-conscious here. And then I asked her, well, Siri, what is love? What is love? It's all a mystery to me, she said. It's all a mystery to me. And then I thought, well, okay, I got to do at least one sort of theological thing. Siri, does God love me? I mean, is there hope? Does God love me? And Siri says, I'm not really equipped to answer that question, Rev. I'm thinking, no one calls me Rev. <clears throat> How does she get off knowing that's my name and calls me Rev? So, uh, you know, I, I just share this as sort of a little way to th have us think about love, that uh, Siri, or uh, male Siri or English uh, uh, female Siri, didn't want to go there, couldn't talk about it, wasn't sure about the topic, wanted to avoid it. Um, you know, I might have to start trying, maybe I should talk to Alexa, maybe she does better than this. Now, we don't come to our digital assistance um, for truth, but we do come to something that is reliable and has stood the t test of time and the ages. And that's the scriptures, that's the Holy Bible. And uh, the Bible speaks, God speaks through the Bible. God speaks to our hearts. Uh, we don't normally hear audible voices. I mean, sometimes they lock people up if they say they've heard an audible voice of God. But I mean, we know God speaks. He has spoken through his eternal word and he speaks to our hearts about these things that are so crucial, about love. And we discover in the scriptures what love really is. And that God is love and that God loves his creation. He loves not only the earth he made, but you. God so loved the world, he loved you. And God not only is love and uh, uh, loves us, is calling us to love. 
He's, he wants to so change our lives that it flows to others. And that's what I want to talk about this morning for this time is how, uh, you know, love changes everything. And because it changes us, God loves us, it allows us to love God back and to love people. Just simply, God loves, uh, God's love changes us so we can love God and love people. Love God and love people. Not because you're so an awesome person and they've got it all together, but because God's love is transforming you. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're in the book of 1 John. If you need a Bible, ushers have some extras you can borrow. You can also find it on U version, and you can find our notes there if you look under events and find Community Baptist. So what I want to do for the rest of this message is sort of just tease out those two things. What does John in this letter talk about in terms of loving God? What does that look like? And loving people, loving God and loving people, because God's love truly changes everything. So um, we're in 1 John chapter 2 now. 1 John's near the back of the New Testament. If you haven't been there before, uh, it's easy to skip over and sometimes, but it's, it's there. You'll find it, five chapters. This is our third week in this message, in this series. Look at verses 3 to 6 with me, verses 3 to 6. John says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. His commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and, his, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now, look at, uh, just if you have your own Bible, you might even want to just uh, do what I do and just sometimes underline or highlight, uh, circle a few words. Uh, in verse three, he says, keep his commands. So uh, if we know him, he says, keep his commands. It's really important. And then look down at verse five, it, uh, that little phrase, obeys his word. So those two little phrases are sort of uh, synonymous. They're saying the same thing, which is, how do we love God? How do we love God? We follow him. We follow him. Also described right there, we keep his commands. We obey his word. Uh, this is nothing new. The same author, John, recorded Jesus' actual words. So John, who wrote 1 John and 2 and 3 John, also wrote the Gospel of John. So if you've never read a biography of Jesus' life, go to John. Um, and Jesus said, and John recorded it in John chapter 15, he said, where is it here? Uh, John 15, 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in His love. You see, there's this connection of love and following, of love and command, of, of obeying. Uh, Jesus modeled it, and He says, this is what my followers will do. Now, um, something that's very important about this and, and, um, is notice how he, he starts with the word know. Those who, who know me, those who know me keep my commands. And this is really important because you might have an impression that the Christian life is all about like all these things I must do uh, or religious obligations that maybe you've inherited or you thought about or that's your impression. But, but John says, no, following God, loving God by obey, obeying him is built on this very word, no. You know him. There's a relationship. Uh, it sort of is sort of a more natural thing actually. Uh, last week, Brad uh, made a reference to marriage, and of course, marriage is a good illustration of where love, where people find themselves in love, and where love gets to grow and foster and gets challenged. And, but the point of when you're in love, it's pretty easy to respect and follow each other, to, to do what they want, because you love them. Uh, and this works both ways, of course. Uh, and so John says, Love, God's love transforms us, so we want to what? Obey the Lord. We want to we wanna love God by obeying his commands. And, and that's, not a, that's not a bunch of religious duty. It's, it's driven because you know him. There's a relationship. Um, and so, uh, uh, and I know, I mean, we know now, now there are lots of things to follow, aren't there? God has not left us without commands and directions for life. And they're hard, aren't they, to follow? And we'll be honest, we, we fail at following God all the time, don't we? I mean, I do. I bet you do too. I mean, if nothing else, think about the Ten Commandments. And, you know, you might have sworn this past week and you took God's name in vain. You blasphemed God. 
or you lied. You flat out lied about something. Okay, maybe it was a small little, you know, white lie, a, a little truth, a little false lie, but it was a lie. You know, maybe you have not honored your parents. And these are all just Ten Commandments. Maybe you did covet. Like you are, you are dreaming about your neighbor's thing that she or he bought, that next best, greatest, fastest, coolest, whatever. And, and so we covet and all these things that happen. And, and so even as John has said, when you love God, you follow and you obey. He has, remember, already told us uh, back just a few verses ago that when we sin, meaning we don't follow all the time, we fail often, what do we do? Confess it. Talk to God about it. Come clean. And then John says it. And, and we have such confidence of our cleansing because we have an advocate with the Father back in chapter 2, uh, Jesus Christ, who paid the price for our sin, for our failures. He's called us, he's called us to himself in love. He's transforming us by his love so that we want to follow him, but we fail at that. So John says, but remember, we have an advocate. He's the one who keeps cleansing us. So even later when we have communion, we talk about the chance to confess sin, chance to be honest with God, to come clean. This is part of our journey in loving God. His commands are not burdensome because we know him. We will still fail, but we have, a, we have the chance for cleansing over and over again. And then um, look at verse 6. This is a real important thing about when it says that we love God by obeying God. Um, again, you might be thinking about all kinds of uh, man-made things. I'm going to call it that even, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But look at verse 6. Um, it says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus, Jesus lived. Live, must live as Jesus did. Oh yeah, my version's saying. Okay. Um, so a little phrase, live as Jesus, live as Jesus. Now here's the thing that's important. Uh, some of us grew up in churches with, as I said, not just we think about all the laws and all the things in Scripture that we fail at, but then there are also all kinds of other things that, that sometimes get thrown into the mix, don't they? For example, when I started going to this Baptist church in high school, I grew up Presbyterian, um, it was a wonderful youth group, a wonderful church uh, that I discovered as a teenager, uh, God drew, kind of drew me to. But um, we wanted in college to have a, back then we called it a, a square dance, but like a country line night, you know? Thought, what, that would be just great. We could reach all kinds of people. What's funner than a great country line thing? And I found out that at this Baptist church, they don't dance. Like, that's wrong. There are rules against it. I didn't know, I didn't know that. Uh, anybody grow up with that kind of like, you can't dance? Sometimes it's like you can't go to movies or you couldn't drink. I thought, where'd this come from? I, I went to church growing up, and I also went to dance lessons. I had to do that. I have to confess. I had to dance lessons, you know. So um, now, there were always reasons in history past why churches made rules, and you'd follow this and don't do that, and, you know, wear a hat to church or whatever, all kinds of stuff in the past. Good intentions, but we always must go back to Scripture and ask, what is helping me, what has God said, that, and how does that work for me today? What is it, how does that, that law, that, well, there's no law about not dancing in the scriptures. We know that. King David danced before the Lord with great joy. So if it's clear in scripture, follow God's will because it's how we love him. And if it's something that feels like it's a bit, you know, a tradition, um, uh, you know, my, my, my dad's family, eons ago, they couldn't read the news, they couldn't read the funnies on Sunday. Like Sunday was a Sabbath, you know, stores were closed, and, for, and don't look at the funnies because those might make you laugh. I mean, so where did this come from? Um, but to ask, does that help um, draw me closer to Christ? Does that help me in my love relationship with Christ? Or is it like just some, some man-made thing? So, so God is inviting us into a very thoughtful Christian journey to um, love Him because his love, He's already loved us. His love's transforming us. And how do I love him? I obey, I follow his word. I respect him, I, I want to do what he wants me to do. Love changes our orientation, so we want to live more like Jesus. We want to live like Jesus lived. And I, I share that verse six because maybe that's just what you think about. Don't, don't, don't get hung up on everything you don't understand or all the, I mean all the laws in scripture. Is it helping you live as Jesus lived? 
And so I want to um, sort of close off this first part about loving God with a, with a question of desire. What's your desire? Like, do you want to live more like Jesus? Is that your desire to live more like Jesus? Because if you want to live more like Jesus, it won't be that hard to, to, to press in and want to follow him, even though we will still fail at it. What's your desire? Um, what are your intentions of your heart? Um, God so much wants to know what your desire is. And if you're not sure, even to say, God, I, I need your help to figure out what I really want. But I'll tell you this. When we struggle with obeying the with obeying Christ, and we want to, we love Him, but we struggle with it. It's not, it's not that little thing that people call sin management, like, oh, I gotta, I gotta work harder, I gotta, like, figure out how to do that command better, don't do that thing, and, you know, as much as, it's, what's the more important thing, how do I, how do I, how do, how do I let God change my heart so I want to? Do I, I want to follow Him, I want to love Him more, because His love changes me. So, I want to follow him. I want to love him. And I know um, this is an ongoing journey. It is for me. Um, one of the things that I, I know that's a very good thing to do is to have extended solitude. Like an actual, like an, af an afternoon or a day once a month. That was sort of my goal last, last summer. I'm going to set aside one day when I will pull away and that will be some focused time of of unplugging and of, of um, reading and, and nourishment and t extended time with the Lord. And a lot of you know about having sort of a mini, we call it sort of a mini spiritual retreat. So I got on my calendar and I, I found a day in August, last August, when the school year started. I thought, yeah, right, one day away. Found a friend's, friend had a place I could use up in the mountains for a day. And then September came along and, okay, I have to go hide myself at a restaurant, but I can do this. I'm going to have like a, and it was pretty good, but not as good. And then October came, and I don't know what happened. <laughs> it all fell apart. Um, so this is an ongoing journey. What, what, what's the desire of your heart so you'll want to, that will help you love God more? Um, maybe it's about just worship, growing as a worshiper. Like being, like I want to go to worship. I want to be there. Maybe it's about having more time in the, to, to have quiet time each morning. Each morning, chair time. Maybe it's growing in your stewardship. Like, I want God to take control of my finances. I want to honor Him. I want to help bless others in my life. Maybe it's in your thought life. Maybe it's how you spend time online or with media. So, so here's a question. I'll, I'll come back to it, but let me just put it up here. And I think it's probably not the grammatically best question. But the question is, uh, where in your life do you want to follow um, Jesus closer or more closely? Um, and sort of just... Just to think, just let that park for a little moment. Is there something in your life that would be, that you just feel like, I think I want to grow closer to the Lord in this way. I love Him, and I want to show that love. I want to follow His commands. And it might be on the top of your mind, like, I know what it is for me. Okay, but otherwise, just put that up there. We'll just think about it for a few moments. We'll come back to it. Where in your life do you want to follow Christ closer? Um, because we all follow something, don't we? We all have things in life that we say, oh, I do that, I follow that, I follow these, you know, baseball, I'm following all the stats in baseball now, I'm following my team, you know, or you're following whatever, you know, so we all follow things. What's the Lord asking you? So love changes everything, starting with me being loved by Him. God's love changes us so we can love God and love people. So let's look ahead in our passage because John deals with both right here. Loving God, and then look at verse 7. He says, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. The old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing, a, writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. All right, so remember, John's talking about uh, how, he's talking about love. <clears throat> you, you will know this for sure after all these weeks, uh, that his love so changes us that we, 
We love God and we love people. I want to say something too. Um, if you've been reading John with us, and you can still can each week, jump into John, or even as we read it here, you might say, you know, it's a little confusing. And you're right. John's writing, especially 1 John, has a lot of the old Eastern approach to writing. It's not, it's not outlined like this. It's, it's circular. And you'll see him saying, I, like you'll read something, he didn't he just say that like six verses ago? Yeah, he did. And he will keep saying these things. It's like another lap around the track to help us remember. Like, oh yeah, I got that same thing again, the same thing again. So John is, is quite abstract and quite circular as just sort of that style in that day. So you get to verse 7. And John is exhorting these Christian readers. Now, these Christians lived in what was called Asia Minor back then. It's like modern-day Turkey. Their churches were all over the place. And John uh, is addressing something going on in their lives. They were getting this attitude, this sort of little bit of a pompous attitude, an elitist attitude. Some of them were thinking, some of these Christians back then, and it's kind of weird to think about, like, people had problems back then? This is like, what, 2,000 years ago. Some of them were thinking, all right, cool sound. Um, some of them were thinking that they had superior knowledge and therefore they were just better than others. And there were some heresies going around. There were some false things going around that we'll look at in a few weeks from now. Um, so John, out of love, out of love for them, has to correct them. And the correction was, you guys need to love well. You claim the name of Christ, now love well. And so he says, um, he talks about an old command and a new command. Doesn't it? it almost sounds there like he's contradicting himself. What is he saying? I'm not writing you a, a new command, but an old one. Well, the old command goes back to the very beginning of the Bible. What do you think the old command was about? It's a four-letter word. Love. Very good. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Leviticus. Love the foreigner in your midst. Love your neighbor. See, love is throughout the scriptures. From the very beginning of Israel. Love God. Love people. And then you get to Matthew 22, and the, the Pharisee asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Because they were thinking about all the laws. Remember, all the laws are going to be so overwhelming. And Jesus said, hey, it's just, you know what it is. It's love God with everything you have. And love your neighbor as yourself. And he, those are not two commandments. They are one commandment, two sides of a coin. It's like a door that, that moves on a hinge. And it's, it's just like, love God and you love others. You cannot separate them. Which is hard for us because we like to segment things. So he says, I gave you an old commandment. I mean, you have an old commandment. You know what it is. But then he says, I have a new commandment. What was that about? Well, the new commandment, brings the readers back to Jesus in the upper room. And the night that Jesus was betrayed, and you may recall, Jesus goes to that room, and he does what was the most humbling, servant-esque kind of thing a person could do. He takes off his outer garment, he gets on his knees, he finds a wash basin, and he brings the disciples over, and he washes their feet. It was a very typical thing to do in, in first century, because you had to get the dust off your, off your sand dirty sandals and feet from being outside, but they are shocked that he is showing love in that way, that that, that that became an act of love. And so the new commandment grew out of that experience, and Jesus said it in the Gospel of John, he says, here's my new commandment, I want you to love each other now as brothers and sisters. A new commandment I give to you that you should love one another, John 13, 34. And then he says, and the world will know you're my disciples by how you love. So he gives them this new commandment that's based on the old commandment, which is more love. But in this case, notice it's a specific kind of love too. It's to the body of Christ, one another. Very interesting, isn't it? Sometimes we, we sort of flip that around. Like, so I know I do. I think, well, it's always easy to love people you hang out with, you know, your friends, your, your spiritual relatives and all. And then everyone, out, everyone else out there, you know, who cares about the world? You know, they're all a mess. And Jesus says, oh, wait a second. Um, you, need to, you need to love those close to you because sometimes they're the hardest to love because you're with them a lot. And you need to love the world. I mean, so this is, this is such a defining thing for, for Christians. Um, when we started the series, we said, 
um, we, we showed you a picture from the sixth century. If you were here a couple weeks ago, it was an ancient picture uh, called the Pantocrator. It was a picture of uh, Christ that someone drew of him in the sixth century. Um, and you remember how he had one, his two eyes were slightly different. One eye was a, was a more stern eye and the other was a more uh, grace-filled eye. And the, the, the sort of the interpreters of this said, this is, this is showing us love through the very eyes of Christ. So what is love? Love, we said, is this perfect blend of truth and grace. Truth and grace. Um, if you just have grace, it leads to sentimentality and you really don't care about the person's well-being. And if you just have truth and, and you want the best for them, but you don't have that sense of grace, gra graciousness, it can be kind of brutal, can it? And so um, John comes back to, this, to these readers and says, listen, you gotta have grace and truth in applying this new command to love each other. And he says, I want you to start right where you live, right with the body of Christ. Because as you know, sometimes those you know uh, or those that are closest to you can be sometimes hardest to love. It's like the story of that man driving down the road, he gets to a bridge, and he notices a guy that's ready to jump off the bridge. And he slams on his brakes and he gets out and says, hey, don't, don't do that, don't do that. He says, uh, uh, you know, just don't uh, jump. And the guy says, oh, listen, it's terrible, it's hopeless, nobody loves me. And the driver says, wait, wait, God loves you and I love you, do you believe in God? And the guy says, well, yeah, yeah, I do. The guy says, well, good, are you? Well, are you a Christian, a Jew, or a Buddhist, a Muslim? He says, well, I'm a Christian. The guy says, well, me too. Well, are you a Protestant Christian or, or, or Catholic Christian? The guy says, I'm Protestant. Well, me too. Um, well, what denomination, the driver of the car says. The guy says, well, actually, I'm Baptist. Oh, well, me too. Are, are you Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? The guy says, I'm Northern Baptist. Well, me too, see? Well, wait, are you, are you a Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? And the guy says, hey, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist. Oh, me too, see, we have so much in common. Well, are you Northern Conservative Baptist of the Great Lakes region or Northern Conservative Baptist of the Eastern region? He says, oh, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist of the, of the Great Lakes region. Well, see, me too. Are you, are you Northern Conservative Baptist of the Great Lakes region of the Council of 1879 or the Great Lakes region Council of 1912? And the guy said, oh, I'm, a I'm part of the Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And the driver just, oh, you scum, just jump. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible stuff. How, but this is how sometimes people of faith treat each other. Because we've, we've created these sort of man-made boxes and categories and stuff like that. And we forget, what did Jesus say? Get on your knees and serve one another. Just love each other. 1 John 3.16, sort of our working, our theme verse for, the, for um, this passage. And 1 John 3.16 is where he says, uh, listen, brothers and sisters, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And then James, I'm James, John says in our passage, uh, hey, you can't love, you can't say you are in the light Another, another code for being a follower of God. You can't say you are following and obeying God and hate someone. Now, I, I'm guessing most of you would not say you hate someone else. But if you do, that's something to work out with God, isn't it? But maybe, um, maybe you wrestle with issues of how you respect someone or someone that has bothered you someone that has hurt you, and they probably were very close to you if they hurt you that way. Jesus spoke about that time someone comes to worship and they want to leave their offering, they want to worship God through the offering, and they remember that someone has something against them. And what did Jesus say? Leave your offering. Don't do it now. You go and reconcile that brother or that sister. You, you go and do your part to make it right. Maybe John had seen how over decades, and John is an old man at this point, he's somewhere, they estimate in his 80s or 90s at this point, he's, he's, he's the oldest apostle there was, and he's, he's seen what happens in relationships, and that we, we take our eye off God, and maybe we stop loving God fully, and we stop following him, and then we start getting sideways with people around us, and we start letting hurts build up, and we, we, we get lazy to not reconcile things. So John says, you know, hey, if you really love God and 
If you really love God, you will love people. And you can't live in the light and let there be things in your life that are causing others to stumble. So loving well is a, is a trademark. Loving well is what we're called to do. Many of you were aware um, and perhaps more intimately connected to the Hartwig family this last winter when they lost one of their sons, Dawson, in a drowning accident. And uh, every parent's worst nightmare, uh, this vivacious uh, young man. And very quickly, um, you know, as word got around, people started thinking about Dawson's life. And the hashtag that became so popular, love like Dawson, love like Dawson. And the backstory is um, Dawson had a huge heart. He was a tall, he was tall to begin with. He was six, three or four, I was tall. And uh, just a huge hearted, loving young man. He was part of our youth group here years ago. One student from uh, his college shared, he said, I think Dawson saved my life. Now, they had never actually been friends, like they weren't like old buddies. But the college student said, you know, I was in a dark time in my life. I was thinking of hurting myself. I, I was really sort of hopeless. But I'd walk down the hall and Dawson, and we, you know, it was kind of the same time every day, you know, heading to class. And I would see Dawson and he would look at me and just kind of like nod his head and smile. And the student said, after a while, I started, you know, realizing in the morning, I, I need to get up because I think I need to see Dawson, you know. And it was just the same thing, a little nod of the head, hey, it's going to be all right, you know, it's kind of that college bob of the head and everything, you know. And um, this was a young man who loved Jesus, and love had so transformed him, he was a love giver. Because when you let love, God's love touch you, it just spreads from you to others. You become a love giver. He noticed people. <clears throat> he paid attention. The eye contact. I wonder even this week if there may be someone in your orbit whom you can look at differently and you can love. It might be the person you live with. It might be your teenager. Teenager, it might be your parent. It might be a fellow student. It might be a co-worker. This is our call to love, to love well. And I want this to be a description of this church, of each of you. And we can't take this for granted. If, if, if those in the first century who had relatively close knowledge of the presence of Jesus on earth could struggle in this, how much more can we struggle in being people who love? So I want to put this other question on the screen. And the question is simply this, how might you love your brothers or sisters? <clears throat> how might you love your brothers or sisters? So those two questions, I want to give you a couple minutes to reflect on. And because we're going to have communion in a, in a few moments, um, I want to put up a third question that sort of relates to the issue of just confession. Uh, is there anything you need to confess today and talk to God about? And I want to give you a couple minutes right now just to sit with those questions. And maybe for some of you, I just want you to sit and know that God loves you, that he's here, he's thrilled you're here, and just enjoy his love. And then I'll come back up in a moment.
a bit as we go into communion, I trust God will continue to speak in your hearts. Um, in the early church, <clears throat> the communion table was often called the love feast, the love feast. No surprise, for it was born out of that time of Christ showing his love on his knees. And then it was magnified when he went to the cross out of love. So I'm going to invite uh, us to do something a little different now. If you're new here, communion, we will, our servers will bring the trays by, and there's the little matzo bread in the middle, and then there's a cup, and you can take one of each. And I want to just say, no one's obligated to have communion, and if you don't want to, you simply can pass the tray on. But we invite all followers of Jesus to have communion. It's open to all who name the name of Christ. Um, so worship team, come on up here, and we'll uh, get started here. But here's what I'd like to invite us to do. Because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, around the very love of God. I'd like to invite you to say something to the person as you hand them the tray. Now, and again, it may not work for all of you, but here's the little phrase. This is Christ's body and blood given for you. This is Christ's body and blood given for you. Communion is simply that. This is Christ's body and blood given for you. Say it with me right now. This is Christ's body and blood given for you. So when you are handed the tray, uh, if you're on the end, the server will say that to you, and then turn and look the person in the eye and just hand them the tray. Uh, and if you, if that is a issue of concern and you don't, just that's okay, you don't have to, just just pass them the tray. Uh, and if someone gives it to you and says that and you don't want to take communion, that's okay, just pass the tray on. Um, but we will wait till everybody is served, and then we'll take communion together. So uh, even as you receive it, hold on to it, and then uh, as after we have sung, I'll come right back up here. So, Lord, your love is the reason we're here. Your love is the reason Jesus gave his life. Your love has rescued us from darkness and still continues to rescue us from ourselves. Lord, I ask for anyone here who hasn't opened their heart to you fully, to your love, that they would do so now, that they would be willing to trust you, willing to let you love them and Redeem them and let you change their hearts. We ask, God, that you continue to change all of us still by your ongoing love. We ask this in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, what a Savior. 
treasure you found So the, the love feast, Jesus models it, shows it, teaches it, and then gives us a lasting metaphor of his sacrifice for us. He took bread there at the Last Supper, and he says in the scriptures, he broke the bread, and he gave thanks, and he said, now this is my body given for you, so take of it and eat. And he continued the, the metaphor. He held up a cup of wine, a cup of redemption in this, in this actual gathering that they had. And he said, now this cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for forgiveness of sins. So as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, Paul, the apostle writes later on, you proclaim Jesus, so we take and we drink of Christ. Lord, we don't really have words to fully express desires of our heart and our thankfulness to you, but we are so grateful and we Ask that by your Spirit's power in our lives, you will help us live out that love this week. 
to those around us, to those we know, and to those farther away, to those we don't know very well, Lord. May your love truly reign supreme. In the name of our Savior, we ask. There is not a man or a beast Nothing on the land or underneath Oh, nothing that could ever come between The love you have for me I could lay my head in Sheol, I can make my bed at the bottom of the darkness deep. Oh, but there is not a place I could escape you. Your heart, your heart won't stop coming after me.
Dear Heavenly Father, how we can sing that with truth, that your heart won't stop coming after us, that we could put our head in shale, the representation of the farthest we could possibly get for you, but your heart will not quit. Your heart will not stop coming after us because your love is furious for us. Your love is deep and wide for us. And your love culminates in you sending your son down, giving his life for us. So that we, it doesn't stop at you giving us love, but us being able to love back. Us being able to love the world. Us being able to love the community around us. Lord, help our hearts be like yours. Help our hearts not quit loving. We thank you so much, Lord, for all that you've given us. And we just ask that you bless this offering. We ask that you, you instill in our hearts the desire to love, Lord. And we just thank you so much for that, that we can love because you first loved us. And we take all this and we surrender all to you. And in your name we pray, all God's people said, amen. amen. And you may be seated. And I'd like to invite the ushers to come on forward. And we're going to sing one last song. And it's going to use one of my favorite words in, in describing God, that God is awesome. So after the baskets come forward, let us all worship, uh, worship God together. Great are you, Lord, mighty and strained. You are faithful, and you will never be. We will. Well, we're so glad you came to worship today. A uh, great time to worship the Lord together and be here. Uh, our prayer team's over here to the left. If you'd like prayer or if you have a question or anything, we'd love to talk with you. So just kind of meander up here. Otherwise, when you go out, uh, well, it's good to meet someone. 
Uh, there's also resources at the Next Steps table, and it's Pancake Day. So get in line. It'll all be off the left. There's plenty of time. If you have kids, leave them in the, no, get them out of Bible class. Just hang out and uh, enjoy and make a support to our youth ministry. So um, as you leave, may the God of all love, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, may his love fill you afresh this week and give you opportunities to love those around you. In his name we ask this. Amen, everybody. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend. It'll be Mother's Day weekend.
wise men say only fools rush in but I can't help falling in love with you take my hand take my whole I can't help falling in love with you. Like the river flows, surely to the sea. Darling, so it goes, some things were meant to be. Take my hand, take my whole life, let's all sing, for I can't help falling in love with you, for I can't I can't help falling in love with you. All right. Well, what does Elvis have on us? We have we have John Lee uh, on the ukulele. Uh, well, we've been playing a, a different love song every week just to sort of uh, wake us up and make us think about how our culture cries out for love. Uh, all of our hearts need love, to be loved and to love. And, uh, and so as we sort of start that way, it's just a, our reminder that even as our culture has all these wonderful songs about love, that we want to keep coming back to Scripture, to the God of all love, and to learn what He has to say about our lives, about those around us, about loving Him and loving others. So that's where we're going today. We're glad you're here. Uh, sorry for the, uh, the challenge of walking in among wafting bacon and pancakes and all that. That's waiting for you after the service, uh, and I probably was a little congested out there. So we're glad you're here. That's all about the youth ministry and raising funds for camp. So we'll talk about that later. Let's stand and uh, worship the God of all love today. The grip of his mind. 
is white and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, and his fury is. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, and it's fury is. His love is sweet, his love is wild. the name of the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord
sing like never before. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Amen, amen. Well, it was a pleasure worshiping with you. I'd like to uh, invite you right now to greet a neighbor or two and share blessings, share a handshake. Well, good morning, everyone. How you doing? Yeah, are we awake? Yeah? Okay, good. That helps me when you guys are awake. So. <laughs> well, we are so glad you're with us here this morning. Uh, just a few things I'd like to bring to your attention that we have coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, but if you'd like to take out your I'm Here card and begin filling that out, you can drop it in the basket a little bit later in the service. Um, first off, we have our date night coming up next uh, Saturday, May 13th. This is a great opportunity for both parents and kids to have a night out. Um, parents, you can go out and spend some time together with your spouse or friends, and you can drop the kids here for a fun night um, of a movie, Moana and Luau. Great opportunity for kids to connect and parents to connect and um, just a fun time, really, for, for outreach. Invite another fam family to come along. You can drop all the kids here, and you guys can go have a few hours together. $5 per child, you can sign up at findcommunity.com slash date night. And then we have a great opportunity um, to connect in a small group called Strengthening the Core, but it's a little bit different than a typical small group in that the first meeting will meet here on campus, May 21st at 11 o'clock, and then the rest of the meetings are on Facebook. So a seven-week small group uh, with one here and then seven or six more on Facebook. Um, great way to learn about our six spiritual habits, things that we value here that we think are important for spiritual growth. And so you can sign up for that at findcommunity.com slash core. And then lastly, a cool opportunity to go to Mexico this summer, June 25th through 30th. It's a Mexico mission trip, a family trip, so your whole family can go along down to Welcome Home um, Outreach down in Vicente Guerrero. I've been there myself. It's, it's a fantastic organization. They have a preschool, and you'll be helping with some VBS down there, and also to help build a home at a women's shelter. Um, it's a great way that you can make a difference in the world um, in a ministry that we've been involved in on a, for a long time, um, and it's safe, and it's fun, and it's a great opportunity to reach out. And there is a meeting next, uh, or I'm sorry, May 21st at 1230 for more information. So I would encourage you to be praying about that. See if God is leading you to um, participate in that um, opportunity. We are going to continue in our time of worship, but let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the beautiful weather. We thank you for no rain on our pancake breakfast. And we just uh, ask that you would continue to just open our hearts and show us the love that you have for us. Uh, we know that love does change everything and love changes us. So we pray that as you do that in our lives, that we would be able to share that love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody, so glad you're here. I don't know about you, is, is it, it's been cold out there and rainy the last, this weekend. How many of you are native Southern Californians? Not Californians, Southern Californians, okay, several of you. This is too cold and too wet for me. But anyway, we can complain. And, uh, but the good thing is it has stopped and uh, the pancakes are great, the sausage is great, the bacon's great, so um, uh, you can hang out after service. We actually, the youth actually did this Friday night after worship service and we said, hey, it's uh, pancakes, breakfast for dinner. It was really a lot of fun. 
I wonder how many of you have uh, had a conversation with Siri or whatever your digital assistant's name is, whatever, or you actually talk on your phone and you ask questions and, uh, and maybe some of you have done that. So uh, Kathleen and I were in the car about a month ago and we had enough time and we were just talking about this series that we're in about how love changes everything. And my wife, who uh, is a little tech savvy and very curious and whom I deeply love, uh, decided to talk to Siri about love. So she pressed the button and asked Siri, uh, what is love? Now, I need to let you know, one thing my wife did on her phone was she changed Siri from a female voice to this very proper English male voice. <clears throat> Got me a little concerned. Um, so um, she asked Siri, what is love? And Siri said, this is no joke, I'm not going there. To which Kathleen asked, why not, Siri? And of course, starting, starting to start, sound a little na uh, weird now. Siri says, I don't know. And uh, then Kathleen asks Siri, do you love me? And he, Siri says, the male voice says, well, you're definitely starting to grow on me. So um, now I tried it this week, and um, uh, we should just try it right now and see, because I've had different answers. OK, Siri, uh, Siri, what is love? I'm sorry. That's all you can say? OK. Uh, Siri, over here. Uh, Siri, do you love me? I'm not allowed to. I know, it's so strange. Well, so what I did, uh, uh, I tried this a few days ago, and I got totally different answers. So for example, when I asked earlier in the week, what is love, Siri said, I can't answer that, sort of similar to what she just said. And then I asked again, what is love? And I got a different answer the next time, and she said, as I understand it, love refers to a deep, tender, ineffable feeling of affection and solicitude. <laughs> yeah, right, what is that? So, I, so then I threw another question at Siri a few days ago. I said, Siri, do you love me? And uh, she answered, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> now I'm starting to feel kind of like, man, I can't even get a computer to say they love me. And so then I thought, okay, let's get a little biblical here, a little theological. Is God love? And she answered, it's all a mystery to me. What a lame answer. And so I thought, let's try one more question here. Siri, does God love me? And she responded, I'm not really equipped to answer such questions, Rev. <laughs> I thought, wait a second, nobody calls me Rev. How does she get off saying, calling me that? Like, well, so um, obviously our experience with Siri has been hilarious and uh, the realization that Siri can't go there, won't talk about it, doesn't have a definition, and is very evasive. Come to think of it, maybe I need to start talking to Alexa. Maybe that would be better. I don't know. Well, we don't come to our personal digital assistants to find truth and meaning to life, obviously. But we do know where to go, don't we? And we come to the God of the Bible. We come to His truth. And He speaks today. Now, we don't usually hear an audible voice. In fact, sometimes people say they might get locked up if they hear God speak to them out loud. But sometimes through our hearts and definitely through Scripture, we hear God instruct. We hear God's teaching, specifically uh, starting with this topic of love, that it is our God who is the God of love. And He made the world out of, from His love. And it says in John 3.16, He so loved the world that He gave His only Son. He loves you. And not only does he love you, and not only is he a God of love, but he's able to empower us to love. He's able to make us become people who love all this from God, all this from the Lord we, we, that we meet. So what I want to do, this is so basic to our Christian faith, and now we're in this series in 1 John, so I want to look at how, God, how God's love changes us so we can, in fact, love God back and love the people around us. God's love changes everything, and it changes you and me to make us people who love, to love God and love others. So we're going to be in 1 John. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you need to borrow a Bible, ushers have some ones you can borrow. We also have all the notes in um, U version. You can find it online. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but I find sometimes it's hard to love, isn't it? Sometimes I get distracted. Sometimes I get frustrated with maybe the, the checkout person or the barista who's not making my drink right. 
uh, sometimes my own family. It, it's not an easy thing to love. And, uh, and we get to come to the scriptures and discover what God ha has to say to us about love. And so what I want to do for this message is I just want to look at these two areas, that because of how God's love, how God's love changes us, we can love God back. We get to, what does that look like to love God? And then what does it look like to love people, the people in our world? So uh, we're going to be starting in uh, chapter 2 in verse, where are my glasses? Oh, there they are. Wumi, can you hand me right behind the bag? There is a pair of glasses. Thank you, thank you. I could get by without them, but then I might be reading other stuff. I don't know. So let's do this. Uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Listen to God's holy word. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now, I want you to highlight just in verse 3, uh, starting in verse 3, there's a phrase there. Keep his commands. Do you see that? I like to sometimes underline or highlight a, a sort of a key phrase. And then look at, and down in verse 5, there's another phrase that says, obeys his word. And keep his commands and obeys his word go together. They're synonymous. They explain each other. They tell us how we love God. How do we love God practically? Well, we show it. We, 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 we follow him. Uh, we keep his commands. We seek to obey what he tells us. Now, um, John, who wrote this, uh, was one of Jesus' apostles, and he also heard Jesus talk about love, and, and John penned those words back in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. This is John's letter, the Gospel of John. Jesus is where he says that if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and I remain in his love. And so, loving God is keeping God's commands. And, um, and so, of course, we might have, you know, thoughts like, oh, this sounds like religious duty. And I want to sort of tease this out a little bit, because some of you have a background where you're thinking, oh, yeah, it's all about stuff to do and oblig uh, obligations and, and laws and rules. And so, now there's a place, God has lots of commands, but I want to draw your attention um, to really a word that repeats itself in our passage a couple of different times. And it's a four-letter word. It's the word no. Look at verse 3, if we, if, if we know that we've come to know him, we keep his commands. And this is really important to realize that, um, that this is not about just rule keeping, like I've I got to obey all these commands. This is born out of a heart that you know God, that you're his child through faith in Christ. And because you know him, there is this, this desire. Uh, in fact, last week, uh, Brad shared a little story about marriage, and it reminds us that in marriage... Uh, it's, of course, a great human expression of love, isn't it? And you fall in love, and you marry, and your marriage grows over the years, and, mar and, and love can struggle as you work out your oneness. I mean, but, but obviously, the environment of marriage is great for love. Well, because you love your spouse, it's kind of natural that you want to help, you want to follow, you want to respond to them, you want to do things for them, right? And that's what John's saying. Listen, you, you know God. You've trusted him. So because you know him, uh, your love for him is pretty obvious. Like you can follow him. You can do the stuff he asks you to do. You can trust him. You can trust his motives. He, he has good plans for you. Now, um, in saying that, now let's acknowledge, though, even though we, because we know him and we seek to obey him, we fail at it, though, don't we? Just like in a human relationship, we fail to, to love perfectly, and we end up hurting some of the very people we say we love. And likewise, so, so John says, if you love God, obey Him, follow His commandments, but yet we don't all the time, don't we? I mean, even just think about the Ten Commandments, like start right there. Like, did you swear last week? Did you take God's name in vain? You blasphemed God. You know, did you lie? Did you somehow fudge on the truth or twist it or overstate something? Yeah, well, okay, I did that. I broke that command, you know. Did you covet your neighbor or your roommate's latest, greatest, fastest, coolest, fill in the blank? 
All right, oh, yeah, there's that command too. Did I not honor my parents? All right, might be something some of you. So, so we break the commandments, don't we? And many other things in scripture. We, we're not perfect at that. We all know that, don't we? And yet John has already told us last week, he's already said the, uh, in chapter one, verse nine, that when we, we know we sin. We don't, need to be, we don't need to lie about it and say we never sin. Because we sin, he says, we, a, we have an advocate with the Father. It's Jesus Christ. So we can confess our sins and receive cleansing and forgiveness over and over. So loving God is about obedience. It is about following Him. It is about uh, keeping His commandments. And yet we know we don't fully, so let's be people who come clean and talk to God and confess our sin. In fact, um, even as we have communion in a little bit, part of the, the spiritual practice of communion is to look within and to be honest with God and confess sin. So John reminds us of this. He lays this out about um, what it looks like to love God. But then, um, again, some of you might be thinking, I know, but there's so many so many commands in Scripture, and what happens sometimes is um, God's people, churches, sometimes start adding things to Scripture. And here's what's really important. Look in verse 6. Uh, he gives us this great verse. He sort of summarizes what it looks like to love God. Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. See, loving God by obeying His commands can be as simple as, am I trying to live as Jesus lived? So here's what I was trying to say about, you know, churches sometimes add things to the list of laws, right? Um, when I started going to this Baptist church in high school, I, I'd grown up Presbyterian, I go to this wonderful church and, you know, neat youth ministry and um, uh, worship and teach, all this great stuff going on. And then I was uh, like a freshman in college and we thought, well, let's have a, let's have a, a, back then we called it a square dance, but it was like line dancing. Let's have a Western line dancing, you know, and I asked the leaders and went up to one of the pastors and I got vetoed like, sorry, we don't dance. I did not know this. Any of you grew up in a situation where you did not dance, like if Christians couldn't dance? Yeah. Where did that come from? David danced before the Lord in the Bible, but this church has a rule against dancing. Maybe for you it was playing cards or movies. Some churches add stuff. Now, now, obviously there were reasons behind why they did that and there were probably some good intentions. But here's the thing. Uh, to simplify, what does it mean to obey God, to love God by obeying God, is what verse 6 says. Am I living, am I seeking to live like Jesus lived? And so clearly there are some things in Scripture that are to be followed. They're just clear. They're very clear. And then there's some other things that sort of aren't as clear and, and, and are sort of added by churches and with good intentions. The question is, are they helping me draw close to Christ? Are they helping me um, um, get closer to Christ or do they create obstacles? Do what, you know, and so, so we have to start, sort of pause and think, am I, am I wanting to live as Jesus lived? Um, Maybe to sort of summarize this area, um, because again, I know we can't unpack every command. We don't even know all the commands. And we fail at them. We know we fail at them. Um, but here's what to think about. If I'm going to love God by keeping his commands, the real question is, do you want to do that? Do you want to live as Jesus did? Key word, desire. What's your desire? Is that what you want? Um, is that... I mean, because if you want to live more like Jesus, if that's your intention, um, then you'll find yourself wanting to go there. You'll find yourself, I mean, so, so what does that look like in our lives? To want to live more like Jesus so you can love God more fully. Because love changes us. Love changes everything. It's changing you to love God. How do you love God? You know, what, what, what's your desire in that area? Uh, for me, last summer, I became convinced once again, it had been many years since I had thought of this, but uh, the, the importance of having some extended solitude and, and uh, sort of a, uh, we might call it like a spiritual retreat. So it could be like a half a day, it could be literally, ideally a whole day or overnight, but where it's like uh, unplugging and it's time to immerse, time to be refreshed in scripture, time to read, time to let Christ and me have time. So I, I put a date on my calendar last August. This day I'm going to have a day in a mini retreat. 
and I did, and I had a friend who let me use his cabin overnight. It was really delightful, and then I found a date in September, and I, and I didn't have a cabin to go to, but I went to a restaurant and sort of hid, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't a whole day, and, and it wasn't as, really as refreshing, but I had two in a row. That was September, and you know what happened by October? Nothing. <laughs> In November, nothing. And so I've gone this whole school year and I've, I've, I've struggled in that area of having, I want to have some extended time uh, uh, because our culture doesn't give us time to really um, gather ourselves to pay attention to our souls. Um, I don't know what it might be for you. Um, you know, for starters, I think as followers of Christ, just do I want to worship? Is that my intention? Do I want to f- love God by obeying Him to be a worshiper and making that a priority? Maybe for you, it it's, has to do with your thought life or how you spend time online or, or just, having, just having time in His Word to read and to pray and to engage in conversation. Maybe it has to do with your stewardship and how you spend your money. Um, but whatever it is, the, 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 the question I sort of want to just leave with you, and, and, uh, and here's the question, we're going to come back to it, but the question is to think about where in your life do you want to follow Jesus closer? or more closely, uh, where in your life do you want to follow Jesus? I mean, have you, have you thought about that recently? Or, or is this one hour sort of a standalone and then the rest of the week you're sort of doing your own thing? So we'll come back to this question, but just to sort of put that little bug in our, in our, in our ear to think, where do we want to grow closer and follow Him? Um, because to love to let God's love change us means we love God. We love God by following Him, by obeying Him. Now, um, it's not only do we love God, but uh, Scripture, then John goes to this next part of loving others. And uh, they go perfectly together. So look at verse 7. We'll just take a time and look at this next piece of loving people around us. He says in verse 7, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Now, I want to just say a little something about John. If you have been reading John with us, and we invite you to each week as we go through this book or even in the weekend, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know if I fully understand John. This is kind of confusing. We fully understand. John is actually a pretty difficult part of Scripture to understand. Uh, He writes in sort of the Middle Eastern mindset uh, where it's not, you know, outline point one, point two, point three, point four. It's one and four and two and back to one and let's go to four. And it's very circular, but in a good way because it's sort of helping us take another lap around that truth, another, another layer of understanding. And so there's a lot of abstraction in John, and I, I have cha- been challenged in this book for many years. Um, so if you kind of wonder, like, I thought, I, I, thought he, I thought he said that like a chapter ago. He did. He's saying it again. We need to hear it. So here he's talking about, okay, um, if love changes everything, it changes how you relate to people. And he writes this letter. John the Apostle writes this letter to challenge, to correct some of the Christians in the churches back there. And this was in the area called Asia Minor back then, modern-day Turkey. There were lots of churches, and they were struggling. People were going sideways. People were were getting very snobby. There were some people who were very, who thought they were very intelligent and they sort of had a one-up attitude toward everybody else. Like, well, we got some special knowledge. We really got this thing figured out. And so John, what? Out of love, out of his own love for them, has to correct them. And what he really wants them to think about is how do you love well? You are brothers and sisters in Christ. You are related. How do you love well? So, uh, so even here, like, he talks about an old, a new command and an old command. It doesn't sound like John's starting to lose it here. Like, why is he saying that? Well, again, he's, he's, we need the instruction. The old command, what does that refer to? 
all the way back in the Old Testament. It is the command to, four-letter word, love. All right, nothing new. The book of Deuteronomy, God says to his children of Israel, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Leviticus is where God says, love your neighbor. Love the foreigner in your midst. Love the person you don't know. So, so love is not like something just in the New Testament. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. That's the old part of it. And then when Jesus is asked by the Pharisees, what's the greatest commandment? Because remember, they were thinking of the 620-some commandments. Jesus says, hey, what's the greatest commandment? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Which, by the way, those are not two commandments. He didn't give two answers to one question. He gave the two sides of the same coin. Love is both a vertical and a horizontal. It is a love God. It is a love others. Um, so that's the old command. Nothing new. But then John says to, the, to these readers, but I gave you a new commandment. What's the new commandment? Well, here's the deal. Um, remember, John was an apostle. He's the last of the living apostles. He's an old, old man by now. So he goes back all the way to, to about probably 33 AD. And he was there. And they went to the upper room to get ready for Passover. And Jesus comes and does the most humbling, subservient kind of thing you could do. He takes off his outer clothes. He gets down on his knees. He gets a basin of water. And he starts washing the dirt off the disciples' feet. A common practice in a day where there were no pavements. It's just feet got dirty in sandals. So coming into a house, you would have the servant. You'd have someone who, could, who would do that job. But Jesus the rabbi, the, the leader, does that. And he goes from there and he says now, in John 13, he, he says now, I, I have a new commandment for you. So those are Jesus' words. I have a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And he goes on and says, this is how the world will know you're actually mine if you have this kind of love one for another. So John says, listen, you Christians, this is what it looks like. To love well, you must be people who serve and love, starting starting right where you have connections in the body of Christ. Because even though we sometimes think, well, we're supposed to love the world, John says, start right here. Sometimes that's the hardest, just to love people near you, people that you've been with, people that you share common bounds, bonds with. Kind of like that story of the man driving and he gets to the bridge and he sees a guy on the edge ready to jump and take his life. So the guy screeches to a halt, jumps out, stop, stop, says, don't jump. And the guy says, oh, nobody loves me. There's no hope. And the guy says, hey, I, I, God loves you. Don't you believe in God? And the guy says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's good. I believe in God too. And he says, are, are, you, are you a Christian or Muslim or Jew or Buddhist? And the guy says, well, I'm a Christian. And the guy driving says, yeah, me too. Well, are you Protestant or Catholic? The guy says, oh, I'm actually Protestant. Well, I'm me too. Uh, what, what denomination, what flavor of Christian? He goes, well, I'm a Baptist. He goes, well, are you a Northern Baptist or a Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. Well, me too. Are you a Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? Oh, I'm a, I'm a Northern Conservative Baptist. Well, me too. Are you a Northern Conservative Baptist of the Great Lakes region or Northern Conservative Baptist of the Eastern region? The guy ready to jump says, oh, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist of the Great Lake Regions. <gasps> Me too. See, it's, we have so much in common. Well, are you Northern Conservative Baptist of the Great Lake Regions Council of 1879 or the Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912? And the guy on the bridge says, oh, I'm, I'm of the Conservative Baptist Northern Great Lake Regions Council of 1912. And the driver says, oh, that's too bad. You heretic. And he pushes him over the wall. I know, terrible, terrible, terrible. Well, um, God's love says you will be changed so you can love those around you. And he, he has this way of starting uh, right again in the body of Christ. And uh, notice he, he says, um, and John says, you know, if you say you live in the light, which is another, another metaphor of being a follower of God. If you live in the light but you hate, you don't really live. In, you don't really, you don't, you're, not, you're not been touched by God's love. And I, I'm, you know, 
fairly certain most of us here would say, well, I don't hate anybody, you know. But maybe you have some, some disregard for people. Maybe you don't respect some people. Maybe you've been hurt by some people. Maybe you uh, just don't understand others and you sort of stay away from them. And John is saying, now listen, if God's love has really changed you, then you will, you will want to press in and love well those around you. Not disregard them. Not do the, the thing back then of feeling superior. Our theme verse in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 is where he says, um, and this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. Again, he, he sort of starts right where we live, don't we? Doesn't he? And he says, uh, if you love well, you'll treat people well. You won't cause them to stumble. So love changes everything. Love is meant to be that trademark of followers of Christ. Many of you know um, of the tragedy that happened this last winter quarter in the sudden passing of Dawson Hartwig, a, a dear young man uh, who actually spent time here in our youth group and a dear family. Dawson drowned. And it wasn't but within hours that so many who knew him came up with a hashtag, love like Dawson. And it was all over social media, even, even some uh, physical places where it was posted and things like that on bridges and stuff. And he was a person who loved. He, it was just his, his very, very much aware of God's love for him and, uh, and had this huge heart um, that reached out to people. Didn't discriminate against anybody. Just everyone could get loved in his midst. I heard of one college student <clears throat> who came up afterwards and said, you know, I, I think Dawson saved my life. And uh, this college student and him were never friends. They didn't really know each other. But they'd see each other in the hallway. And this college student said, you know, I was in a pretty dark time in my life. Uh, and I was thinking of, of maybe hurting myself. And I would walk down the hall and Dawson would just look at me and kind of bob his head and, you know, a little smile. And, and, uh, and, and the, the guy said, I, I started realizing... And this happened every morning, you know, as they'd walk to class, you know, it's kind of this proximity, same place, same time. And, and uh, the fellow said, you know, I started to realize I, I really sort of wanted to get up and make sure I got to the campus so I could see Dawson again. And that kind of casual bobbing of the head and a little bit of a, a few words or even a grunt that sort of said, hey, it's going to be okay and you're, it's good to see you kind of thing. Dawson uh, was a young man who loved well. He saw people. He noticed people, and uh, his, his legacy of love lives on, even though his, his life was cut short. Loving God and loving people go hand in hand. They are not separate. You cannot love God if you don't love people, and if you genuinely love people, you are loving God. And maybe there's somebody this week that you could look at differently. And you could have eye contact, or you could talk to, or you could, you could help them in some way. You could be available to them. Um, God's love changes us so we can love God and we can love people. This is our call to love well. So I want to put another question up here um, to have us sit with for a few moments here. And the question is, um, how might you love your brother or sisters? Your brothers or sisters, like, like literally in the days ahead, this month, this next season, is there someone in your, in your world? And again, uh, God calls us, calls us to love everybody, love the world, um, but, you know, he's got a particular thing here even about your brothers and sisters in Christ. And now we're going to be um, transitioning to communion here. And I want to give you a few moments to sort of just be quiet with the Lord. So again, sort of this idea of just let's just sit and give ourselves some time to, to hear from God. I've talked plenty. So I have a third question as well as we think about going to the Lord's table, which is what do you need to confess today? You know, all kinds of commands. We fail. 
We, we don't do the things we know we should do, and we do the things we know we shouldn't do. So um, and maybe some of those things have been the ways we've not loved. So I'll just give you a couple minutes, um, and you can close your eyes, you can write, you can read, you can think about the Lord speak of your heart, then I'll, I'll come back up. chance to hear from God can continue as we sing and as we take communion. Um, This table in front of us, as simple as it is, in the early church was actually called the love feast. Um, Christians, when they had communion, they anchored it, of course, back to that time where Jesus washed the disciples' feet and broke the bread at communion, and, and it became known as the love feast. Um, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are invited to come and take communion with us. Um, and I, let me s- just say a few words about it. And worship team, come on up here. We'll uh, prepare to sing. Um, but uh, uh, our servers will, will pass the trays, and uh, they have the cup and the bread together, so you take one of each. Um, we'll, we'll wait till everybody is served, and then we'll partake together. But I'd like to do something different today. As we think about you know, this call to love well, to love in the body of Christ, um, for us to take the love feast a little a little more seriously, and I want to ask you to, if you'd be willing to say something uh, as you pass the tray. And here's what I want you to say, just this little phrase, this is Christ's body and blood given for you. This is Christ's body and blood given for you. This is Christ's body and blood given for you. Let's say it together. This is Christ's body and blood given for you. Um, now, if you, if that is difficult to say to someone or freaks you out, you don't have to. Just pass the tray on. Uh, and if you are not taking communion, uh, you can still pass the tray to someone else, and you can still say it if you want, or you can just pass the tray and that, don't say anything. That's okay. Uh, no judgment. Just, but, but if you feel uh, able... Uh, and I'm going to, this will fall, this will not be on the screen because we're going to sing, but says, this is Christ's body and blood given for you. Um, the servers will start by passing out those trays. And, uh, and then, um, as I said, we'll wait till everybody's served and I'll come back up together. So let's pray. Lord, your love is the reason we're here. Your love is the reason Jesus gave his life. Your love has rescued us from darkness and still rescued us, and still continues to rescue us from darkness. Lord, I ask for anyone here who hasn't opened their heart to you, that they would today, they would even right now, truly say yes to you, to your body and blood given for them. In your name we pray, amen. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst? 
for a drink from the well Jesus is calling So in that upper room, chance to live out and model real love, love that sacrifices. Love, as we have said, is this blend and perfect fusion of truth and grace. And Christ wanted to give the disciples an ongoing remembrance of what love is, not just the washing of feet. So he 
he picks up bread and, and it says in the scriptures that he, he took the bread and he, he broke it and he gave thanks and said, this is now my body given for you. So we take the bread and we remember our Christ. Take and eat. And then our Savior continued the, the metaphor with a glass of wine, a beverage. He held it up and said, this wine is the new covenant in my blood shed for forgiveness of sins. So Paul adds to it, as often as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we proclaim our Savior. So we take and we drink of Christ. Lord Jesus, we don't really fully have words to describe the depth of our gratitude, uh, the amazement of your love that continues to speak truth to our hearts and graciously welcome us and receive us. But we'll say thank you, Lord. And we ask that by your, the power of your spirit changing our lives, that love will truly multiply in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our community, in our church, of course, and to the ends of the earth, Lord, so people would know that you are the God of love. In your name, amen. There is not a man or a beast Nothing on the land or underneath Oh, nothing that could ever come between The love you have for me I could lay my head in Sheol, I could make my bed at the bottom of the darkness deep, oh, but there is not a place I could escape you, your heart, your heart won't stop coming after me.
Father, how true that is that your heart won't stop coming after us. That we could lay our head in the representation, shale, the representation of the farthest we could get from you, but your heart will still won't stop coming after us, Lord. We thank you for that. And we thank you for the ultimate act of love of you sending your son down to die for our sins so that we could be redeemed, Lord. And I just pray that we that we love back, that we love in response to your love, that we love others, that we love the world, that we love the, the, the community around us, Lord, because you first loved us. Help us to do that today and the rest of our lives, Lord. And we just pray for the offering. Help us love through that, Lord. Just help us give generously. Help us experience love and give the love that you have shared with, you have shared with us, Lord. So we thank you so much for that. And all of God's people said, Amen, amen. All right. Uh, you could go ahead and uh, go ahead and take a seat real quick. Um, I'd like to invite the ushers to come on forward. And we're going to sing one last song, and it's going to talk about how awesome God is, which is my favorite way to describe God. Um, so after the bats go by, just I'd like to invite you all to stand. <laughs>
let's thank our worship team for leading us this morning. All right. Thank you, tech team. We're grateful to have John up here as part of the worship team. But Tyler is actually on the drums this week. Can you believe that? Tyler, the worship team. so talented. And we're really glad you came today. Thanks for being here. So uh, um, um, two things. Uh, well, prayer team is up here to the left. If you'd like prayer for healing or have a question about spiritual things, what's like to talk, we'd love to meet with you up here. And then secondly, uh, breakfast is served. Uh, it is a donation of five bucks. It's all about helping uh, defray costs for getting our teenagers to the two different camps. There's a junior high camp, a high school camp. So um, pancakes, bacon, sausage, hang out, meet someone you don't know. There's resources out there at Next Steps table. And uh, and the next weekend's Mother's Day, so we look forward to seeing you as you leave now. May the God of all love, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, uh, refresh your life with his love, encourage you with his love, and give you that chance to really uh, share that love with those around you this week. May you go in his grace. God bless you. We'll see you next weekend, everybody.